Okay. At 6.15, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to kill my video for this because uh, we're running it locally on NGROC, and the video plus the screen share plus the NGROC makes it a little too slow. And Slack is really uh, picky with the response time on some of these things. And with the in practice runs with the video on, sometimes it'll just pass that threshold where it starts resending messages and things, and uh, and things don't work quite right. So uh, here, have a look, and I'm about to go away. It can, yeah. All right. So we're talking about creating our text-based adventure games with Drupal and Slack. Now I'm uh, flipping back and forth between PowerPoint and Chrome with Slack in it and some PHP Storm. Uh, so I'm, I'll, I'll check the, uh, the session for chat messages as I can. Um, and then, uh, but if I don't get to them, I'll try to get to them at the end. So let's get started. Uh, who am I? I'm Jack Franks. Uh, I work for Breakthrough Technologies. Like I said, I'm going to kind of skip some of the touchy-feely stuff because, again, this is a very uh, dense presentation. So uh, I'm just going to try to get into it and get going. So what are we doing? We're recreating a MUD in Drupal and Slack. So these are text-based adventure games, and you kill monsters and solve puzzles to gain levels and get powerful and then beat the game. Uh, I was a, a modem kid you know, from, from the start and, uh, you know, built a, a Heathkit modem and then dialed into a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of bulletin boards. Uh, once multi-line BBSs really got popular in the, you know, mid to late eighties, uh, I was just hooked. Uh, the D dial chat boards, the major BBSs, uh, that, that's what really, uh, that's what really got into me. And this is what really, uh, inspired me to have a, you know, do it to pursue a career as a software engineer because uh, of the coding that I would do in order to to do all this stuff. Uh, so we had all kinds of, uh, of multiplayer interactive text games uh, like Zork, but uh, but imagine it for 32 players. So I've ported one called Chirondia, which was uh, available for major BBS. Uh, starting in 89 and uh, was actually hugely popular. Even all of the major BBSs that are up now that you can tell that into, uh, everyone that I have hit still has a version of Chirondia going. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in it in my youth. So it was really uh, it was really cool to get back into it and see how it all works. So first we're gonna do a quick demo. Uh, and again, I know Hopin gets a little finicky with how it does all of the screen shares and uh, and uh, switching back and forth to Windows, but here we're gonna do it. So uh, here is uh, a Slack window. We can see that I'm already logged in. I can start interacting. Oh yeah, see, it's already slowing down. Uh, so here, uh, I'm, on this, uh, I'm on this path. You know, I can move around. Uh, you can hear it chiming at me in the background. I'll turn my volume down. Uh, you know, I can, I can walk around the world. No, I don't have the uh, I don't have partial names turned on right now. And uh, yeah, so uh, here we can go around and see. Like here, we're in the village square. I can go up north here in the gem cutters hut. Uh, one of these actually has a sign in it that you can interact with. And again, here we can see that it's, uh, you know, it uses ANSI to, uh, to draw everything out and Slack doesn't like line breaks in the middle of its messages. So uh, this is basically how it works. You know, we can use Slack to interact with the engine and then it serves up the game and we can play it all right here by uh, DMing with the bot. Uh, so who wants to see how it works? I'll take that as everybody. OK. Uh, usually, I host this on a free Pantheon dev site, because I just sort of use Drupal to uh, you know, accept the Slack messages and serve up the responses. 
that just needs to hold some content. It's nothing, uh, you know, it's nothing big or, or heavy. Uh, today, as we can see from the kind of slow performance, we're using ngrok on my local instance. Uh, the Slack app is just sort of a regular Slack app. There's nothing real special to that. I'll go through the steps to actually create the, uh, the Slack app at the end. Uh, and then the URLs for everything are set to our, our, our ngrok uh, URLs today. I have a handful of new modules that I've whipped up for this, including Word Grammar, uh, Slack Incoming, Slack Mud, Chirondia, and then the Migrate module to get all the Chirondia data in here. And I'll be going through each of these. Word Grammar was a pretty fun one. Uh, and I was a little bit shocked that I've never had to do anything like this before. Uh, but putting this game together was the first time that I've really had to uh, properly format uh, a whole bunch of dynamically created text. So uh, there's uh, some PHP library. I actually can't remember uh, which one I used, but I wrapped a service around it so that it's easy to get in Drupal uh, to give you indefinite articles for nouns because we have to put things together. Like, uh, you know, when we saw the items on the ground, there was a garnet there. So if there's also an amethyst there, it needs to be an amethyst. Uh, so it needed to be smart enough to know how to assign each indefinite article. So like Apple gets an an uh, because it starts with a value, but like unique also starts with a value, but it gets a, so it's a unique something. Ah, okay. Uh, I see that's about the, uh, the mid camp slides. Good. Uh, and same thing with uh, our versus horse. So those both start with an H horse gets an, uh, and our gets an, an, uh, and then we needed to format those arrays of objects back out, uh, with, you know, commas. And of course, an Oxford comma, if you don't use that, you can, uh, you can just hit the leave button right now. No, I'm just kidding, but really you should use it. Uh, in order to, uh, port over the old game, we had to do, well, a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, there were data files that had text descriptions for all of the locations and items and spells and descriptions, all of the various messages that happened from all of the actions within the game, what the actual levels were, what the uh, male and female level descriptions were. Uh, you know, again, this is a game from 1989. Male and female is all that it gave us. Uh, and I just sort of ported it over. Um, there's a, uh, a, a whole bunch of C code here that needed to be ported over. I started going down the route of, uh, you know, sort of re-architecturing it in a way that made more sense to me and doing the things that I thought were more correct. But uh, that just added so much time and complexity into doing it that uh, ended up just kind of going with the flow then and really just kind of porting over the code the way it was written. Uh, so it needs to handle all of the commands that the, that the users type in. It needs to handle special, uh, you know, specific location commands, like maybe if you dig in some room versus digging in a different room, you'll get different results. Uh, and then the, dis the, the different system interaction routines so that if you do something that might affect the whole world or, you know, some particular room or, you know, uh, interacting with different players and objects and things, uh, plus the timed events, all of that had to, to come in here too. So we have ancient data that we need to import. Uh, we have the source code from major BBS now written by Scott Brinker and Richard Skernick. And this is again from 1989. Uh, there's a question, am I using uh, Drupal cron to create a game heartbeat? Uh, I did start doing that and then no, because uh, like the question says, are you abusing it? Uh, the Galacticom software runs its uh, pulse every eight seconds and you cannot run cron every eight seconds. Uh, I found a uh, free cronjob.org uh, service that just lets me hit a URL. Uh, I've got an endpoint on the app which does the updates. Um, but the, the fastest I could do it is one minute. So, uh, you know, the game has slowed down a little bit because now the, uh, the events are a minute apart. Uh, but no, you cannot do this with cron. It is, uh, it's, it's too hungry. It's too slow. So we can look at, uh, how we import the code, uh, on the left here, we've got reader, which is, uh, handling reading something like a spell book, a scroll, 
or uh, or whatever, and we can kind of see what it does. It has its uh, its handlers for the player's inventory. It checks the uh, the m arg value that uh, you know this is how it dissects the uh, uh, the sentences, the sentence structure that the user types in. So uh, m arg v zero will almost always be the the verb. So read. And then here, uh, mrv1 is spellbook. So if you type read spellbook, uh, then you know we do a, a whole bunch of stuff in here. We check that we uh, that we have something. If it you know if it if it's not your spellbook, you have to check to make sure the user has the item, and then the item has to be readable, and then it does a thing. And uh, or if the user doesn't have the item, it has to push back uh, a message to the other. You know, so the onlookers, the other uh, users in the room. Um, so it has to do, you know, it has to do a bunch of stuff that, uh, and there, and there's hundreds of commands. All of these needed to be ported over. Uh, on the right here, we can see what the text looks like. So there's thousands of these uh, text objects here. Uh, so the first thing we have is some sort of an identifier. You know, here HLP MSG, so a help message, and then we open up with a curly brace, and then we have as much text as we want. So here's just lines and lines of text. Uh, there are ones that are longer than this, and as we can see at the bottom, there's uh, there's shorter ones too, and then a curly brace, and then a T, and then the type of message that uh, that it is. So in this case, this is a Chirondia description. There are also things like level description and uh, you know item descriptions. So we we use that identifier to pull them all out. So here's another example of one of these uh, messages. Here's a, a level description for a female level four. Uh, and we can see there's a, a percent %s in here. Uh, there's a format to the way it does its tokens. And you, know, you can see the, that these are nicely paragraphed and, and some of these are you know, flowery and descriptive. And playing this 30 years ago, I never really realized that all of the messages followed the exact same token pattern. So it's always first uh, the name, and then a uh, you know a him her pronoun, and then a possessive his her pronoun, uh, and all of the messages are stored out in that same format. Uh, but again, some of them get you know multiple paragraphs, and uh, until really getting in there and seeing how it all worked, I didn't even know it did it. Uh, so in any case, in order to get these into the system, we need a migration source that can parse it. So here it is. Uh, we have a, an iterator. And again, don't worry about, uh, you know, taking notes on all this stuff. Again, there's I, I put a, a, a link to the repository up in the chat. And then at the last slide, there's also a nice link that you can uh, that you can pull out and uh, and you can get to this. Um, so in order to make a migrate source plugin work, you need an uh, initialize iterator method here. And what this does is it gets the, uh, the file uh, from whatever the path configured is, uh, takes, it, it standardizes all of the new lines, and then it starts walking through the file. And once it sees an open brace, then it walks every line until it gets the next close brace, identifies what the name of that is so that uh, like that HLP MSG help message identifier, and then it also pulls out the type, so that's anything at the end after that, uh, after the T. Uh, it builds up an array of rows and then passes that back in an array iterator. Now, when you're building a migrate source, you have to remember to return an iterator. Uh, the documentation on this was actually incorrect for a long time, and it said that the return type here was an array, but if you return an array, it doesn't actually work. Uh, it has to be an iterator. So if you're putting a migrate source together and in your migrate status, the uh, the count is correct, but no data ever comes out, it, you're probably not returning an actual iterator in here. Uh, so check that and then, uh, and then you'll get your data out. Here's what the actual migration looks like for items. Uh, we can see that uh, we've got uh, our source here uh, and then the, the Chirondia MSG uh, source plugin that we were using, and then uh, the path to the data files, which we just have included inside the modules data directory. Uh, and then we're pulling out the, the columns that we defined in the iterator. Uh, the only ones we care about for this particular import are name and description. Uh, if we wanted to do something with that type, we could, but again, for this one, we don't need to. 
they write out a taxonomy term of uh, the type Chirondia message. And then, uh, you know, these have the enforced dependency, so it turns off with the module. And then uh, we need the uh, reference to the actual game migration, which creates the initial game record. Uh, now, we bring in a whole bunch of these things uh, in a whole bunch of different formats, uh, and we save them all out in Drupal as nodes and taxonomy terms. So uh, I could have gone terms the whole way because the import files really are the system of record here. We don't need revisions. We don't need a lot of that. Like ownership doesn't matter. We don't need most of that stuff. Uh, but, you know, like locations and items, uh, these are nodes and then messages, spells, and levels are all, uh, are all terms. We can have a look at what these look like. If we look at a particular location, here's number 268, and it's got this uh, this nice description in it. You're on a red carpet and stairway, et cetera, et cetera. We can see that it belongs to the Chirondia game, and it has two exits. Just as it says in the description, you can go north or south. If you go north, you get to 269. If you go south, you get to 276 or 267. Uh, I have another module that uh, that I use here. There, there's a whole bunch of ways to do this, but uh, I whipped up a uh, uh, an entity reference with label module here, so that uh, you know it's just another property of the field type where you can define a little string that goes along with the reference. And again, you can do that in any number of different ways. Uh, I just happen to use that one. Uh, we can see the visible items on the ground include a garnet, and and that's it. Uh, and then the object has a, a location string here so that uh, when you look or enter the room, you get the full description. And then it will say there is a garnet on the ground. Uh, there's a brief description. I don't have brief uh, descriptions working right now. You get the verbose description all the time. But in normal gameplay, when you type brief, uh, if you have been to a location already, instead of the big long text, you get this you know, this short little text. So it just says you're on a red carpeted stairway. There is a garnet on the ground. Uh, but like I said, I don't have the brief stuff working. And then there's a collection of default items. So when the game resets, uh, that happens at, uh, I don't know, whatever, midnight or 2 a.m. or whatever on the normal Galacticom schedule. Uh, uh, but I, I have that I have, have that running on an actual cron job. Um, when it resets, it clears out all the visible items and then puts the default items back in there. So there's items that are supposed to be in particular uh, locations. So moving on to items, we can see here uh, we have a scroll and it's got a little description on it. And then you can pick it up and it's visible. Uh, here we have a tree and it's got a description here, and this is uh, not pick upable and not visible. And if you try to pick it up, it has a deny message on here. Uh, so the reason it has, uh, you know, it's invisible and you can't pick it up is because you can interact with it. When you're in the, the location that this tree is in and you look at the tree, you know, you get this, uh, you get this description, which has a, uh, you know, a riddle to solve here. And clearly this is Neil. And if you type in Neil here, uh, then, you get to the next level, sort of like this. So if we go north, yeah, boy, it goes to sleep real fast nowadays, doesn't it? Uh, let's go over here. So that tree is here. If I look at the tree, yeah, there's the uh, there's the description of it. Now, if I kneel, oh my goodness, there we go. Well, there's a bug. Uh, it's supposed to put me up to the next level, uh, but we'll get to that kind of interaction in a minute. And then we have uh, messages. So messages, as I said earlier, these all have uh, a particular sort of format to them, and they all go 0, 1, 2, and then 3, 4, 5. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about the three, four, and five. Uh, so for the, the, this spell ID, 17, uh, our three is what the caster sees. So here I, you know, if I cast uh, a, a red bolt uh, flies from your fingers and strikes Eric in a small bright flash. Uh, so then number four goes to the target. Uh, so when I cast that, Eric sees 
uh, a red bolt flies from Jack's fingers at you and strikes you in a small flash, causing you however many points of damage this one does. And then uh, any bystanders uh, or onlookers, you know, other people in the same location who aren't the caster or the target, see the number five, which is uh, a, a, a red bolt flies from Jack's fingers at Eric and strikes in a small flash, and Eric, and he loses some strength. Uh, we have some terms for spells. So this has the, uh, the, the name of the spell, which is how you, you cast it, a uh, brief description of it, and then the minimum level. Now this doesn't actually relate to the messages uh, or the effects of the spell. This is just an easy way to uh, have an entity reference for the user's spell book so that if you know this spell, uh, your spell book entity reference field will just include a reference to this or this or whatever. Uh, all of the spell effects are handled in the uh, the caster plugin, which we'll dissect in a little bit. So, Cron, uh, yeah, we got a couple of things we need to do here. So, we need to reset the game and respawn everything. Now, that's an actual Cron job, uh, but the game also has a regular pulse that uh, that it does things on, like moving around creatures and. Uh, you know, decrementing spell effects or, uh, you know, if there, there's things where you can interact with the world, like, uh, you know, if you're at the big altar and you chant some prayer in order to solve that puzzle and gain your level, like th those effects only last for so long. Uh, on the major BBS, the original game runs those every eight seconds. It beats every eight seconds. Now that is real hard to do on Drupal. That's expensive. Uh, so you can't do that with Cron. Uh, Again, I found this cre this free uh, cronjob.org service, which just let me set up a you know a free HTTP uh, post every minute. So uh, you know the game is now spread out from eight seconds to a minute. But you know it's still uh, it's still fun and it works. Uh, if I was making this you know big and prime time and available, maybe I would figure out a way to actually make it happen every eight seconds. But a minute works for for just playing with it. Uh, so to play the game, uh, it, it, the players interact with it entirely through textual commands. Uh, they type in the commands to do things like, uh, you know, moving or looking at, uh, at objects or people or, or talking to things, uh, picking up objects, doing things with them, whatever. So, you know, to check your inventory or to move around to pick things up off the ground or drop them, you know, attack monsters, whatever. Uh, so to handle all of those, we use custom plugins that handle each one of those individual verbs. We have an event listener that gets the command string that we uh, we, we pass in from uh, the Slack event listener. Uh, again, we'll get all into all of this momentarily. Figures out what plugin to use, creates an instance of the plugin, performs the action, goes through the uh, the results, and then sends out the appropriate messages to the appropriate players. So in Drupal or Symphony, uh, in order to fire an event, it looks a little something like this. Uh, I've got a little bit of duplication on here. It's all passed by reference. You don't actually need this uh, this in here. Just passing in the uh, Slack event at the end is enough to get it. Uh, so we we uh, declare a new Slack event and we pass in the uh, the package. This package is the uh, the uh, payload that we get from the Slack event. Uh, which has, you know, who sent it, what the text was, the timestamp, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we pass that into the event, and then we dispatch our Slack event. Uh, and now every listener on this Slack event uh, can modify this actual Slack event object. And then uh, at the end, we do a get response and then do something with it. So get response is really the only thing that we, excuse me, that we care about here. Um, so here's what the uh, what the actual event class looks like. So we have the constant that defines the actual name of the event that we're listening for, and uh, you know now it's a constant, so everything's all nice and standard. It's easy to find references to the constant to make sure you know everyone who's uh, who's actually listening to this. And then again, for our event here, all we really care about is this response array. So we've got a, a getter and setter on it, and uh, uh, I see a question, I put the constant in the event subclass, I do. Uh, because this way, again, every listener uh, can just reference uh, the constant right on the event 
and, uh, and, and it's all nicely self-contained. I don't have to go outside the scope of the event in order to reference anything on the event. Uh, we need a, a subscriber to do the, the listening. So here we're gonna need a uh, module services info YAML file. Uh, in this particular case, this is the Slack one for the Slack incoming module. So uh, we name it with the, uh, the name of our module and then the name of our service. So Slack incoming dot Slack service subscriber. Here's the class that handles the, uh, the event and the argument we pass in. And we have a Slack service inside this uh, Slack incoming module that, uh, that uh, handle, you know, interacting with Slack, passing messages back to it, et cetera. And then we name it as an event subscriber so that uh, Drupal knows what to do with it. Uh, now the event subscriber class uh, in, uh, implements event subscriber interface and we need the get subscribed events on there. So uh, here we, uh, we look at our events and this is where we're using that, uh, that constant to, uh, to, you know, to listen for that particular event. And then here's our callback and here's our priority. And uh, uh, if there's multiple uh, listeners on this particular event, it runs in uh, numeric priority in descending order. So uh, like it'll run an 800 before a 600. Uh, so that way you can get everything nicely prioritized. Here's the event listener. I know this might be a little small, uh, but I'm gonna walk through it. So hopefully uh, you can still see it. Uh, so here's our callback function. Uh, it takes the event as our argument here, and then immediately we start taking it apart and looking what Slack sent us. Uh, so if, it, if we have a type on the message and the type is URL verification, uh, this is that, uh, that challenge um, that uh, whenever you set up events, an event endpoint in Slack, immediately it sends a URL verification uh, message to your endpoint, and then you have to immediately pass back the challenge token that was in the package. So that's what this does. Uh, we also have another event callback on here, which looks at the app home opened event, and then uh, it returns some some stuff here. So uh, you know, here's uh, some some Slack uh, markdown that it uses to. Uh, to display what goes on this home tab. So, you know, like here, hello, you can use this uh, cool Slack app. And then if I there we go. Now, if I change this, we can, uh, we can change the event right here. And then uh, when we change this markdown, uh, now every time it gets the event callback uh, for the app home opened, this is what it returns. Uh, and I, you know, we can change this to however we want it to be. We can turn that back. Come back out of presentation mode, and now flip back here, flip back to home, bam, now it's back up, uh, back to what it used to be. Uh, whoops, let me go back up one. And then uh, it uses the views.publish method in Slack API to post this back. So there's a, when, a, when a user is interacting with Slack, there's a few things that uh, they can do that will immediately prompt a response. Uh, interacting with the, the homepage tab is, uh, is one of them, doing a slash command is another. Uh, so when a user interacts with Slack, with, with Slack, it opens up a window of when the user is allowing Slack to interact back with the user, which is why these things have to all come back on the same response. Uh, when it, uh, you know, when it's, uh, you know, like when we're, we're handling the, the text commands that you type, like, you know, look or, you know, cast uh, first aid or whatever, uh, it sends those message, messages back because the bot is allowed to uh, send messages to the user. That happens in app setup. Uh, and that can happen independently of the user's actual response. A bot can actually send a message to a user whenever it wants. 
but when a user does particular interactions, it has to interact. It has to return that interaction right away, which is what we see here. So if we look at how custom plugins work, uh, a custom plugin needs a custom annotation. It needs a plugin manager, and then you need your interface and plugin class uh, to make. Oh, that was weird. Sorry, my uh, my my hop in flashed strangely. Uh, uh, so we need uh, yeah our base plugin class, and then the interface that uh, you know that that defines our uh, our basic plugin behavior. So here's what the uh, the plugin annotation class looks like. It just defines the properties that you're using in your annotation. And here we just have an ID and then a textual name and then synonyms, uh, which I don't have working yet. So this is uh, like if you type look, um, you know, it uh, it realizes that that goes to the particular look plugin. Uh, but if you type examine and examine is a synonym of look. Ideally, it should be able to uh, to reconcile those, and when you type in examine, it should also give you a look command, uh, but I don't have that working yet. Uh, now you need a custom plugin manager. Now, most of this is boilerplate. Uh, you're going to write this once and then copy and paste it for the rest of your life. This is, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty standard. So uh, the plugin manager needs to define what the plugin directory structure is, uh, you know, what the namespaces are, uh, how to alter it, uh, what the plugin interface looks like, and then where the annotation is. Uh, it also sets the caching backend, which you know here is just the stock one. Uh, we have an alter info, so uh, we have Slack mud command info. So if you did a custom module Slack mud command info alter, you can get in and, and change all this stuff. Uh, the directory structure, it'll always be an SRC plugin mud command. Uh, and then here's the uh, the interface for the plugin manager to return, and then here's the annotation so that it knows what the plugins are supposed to look like. Uh, that's kind of all there is to it, but this is something you need to define pretty much every time you do a custom plugin. Again, you're going to write this once and copy paste and and tweak. Now, if we look at the actual plugin interface. Uh, we're defining here what each of the, the actual plugin instances have to do. Uh, for our game, really all we need is the perform method, uh, which takes the command text that, uh, that Slack got from the player, whoever's doing the actual action, and then a reference to the results array, which is how we pass back uh, the different messages to the different players. So here we have an actual player node ID, uh, and the Slack, uh, you know, the, the Slack service knows how to get each one of these from each actual username. Uh, so, you know, this uh, this particular player, 1735, gets uh, you know gets two things. So clearly, he's looking around in the dark here. You do not see anything here. You might be eaten by a Gru. Uh, another player who happens to be in the same location will see Jack is looking around. Uh, so we have our uh, our plugin base class. Uh, the base class, you know, here we're setting up all of our dependency injection and everything that most of the uh, plugins are going to need. Of course, a child plugin can you know override uh, whatever its inherited uh, parent plugin is using. Uh, but when we uh, when we do it this way, you know, we get all of our nice uh, services and you know everything nicely dependency injected, so that all of the children can get it. Uh, so let's uh, let's have a look at this this complicated cast one, and uh, and we'll we'll see how it all works. Okay, here's cast now. Presentation mode gets really big. So uh, if you double click on the screen share to maximize that, I'm going to ask uh, to respond in the chat. Is this big enough as is in order to see it, or do I need to embiggen it? OK. All right, let's go to presentation mode. Now it's going to get really big, and I can't see the chat anymore. Uh, because it blanks out the other window. So uh, we're going to look at this perform method, which again takes the command text, 
the acting player and then this uh, results array. Uh, it's going to figure out where the acting player is, get their custom profile. Now, the Chirondia profile basically is uh, just a, an entity that has different game effects uh, for whatever player is passed in here. So, uh, like, there's there's different protections. Like, you could have lightning protection, general object protection, fire, etc. Uh, all these things get stored on that profile. So here we have some grammar checking to make sure that uh, you know you don't just type cast. If you do, it uh, it says that you're going bananas or whatever. Uh, if it uh, if it only has one more uh, word here, it knows how to get the, the spell name. And then if it has another word here, uh, it gets the target name. There's some magic that happens before it gets here where it strips out uh, things like at and to and in. Uh, so if you, you know, you can cast uh, Zanira at Mary and it, it knows to strip the at out. So it just goes zero, one, two. Uh, we have some special exceptions here. Uh, here's one if you cast this in this particular location, it gives a, a clue, a message. Uh, and then we get into actual spell casting mode. So first we make sure that the player memorized the spell, that they're of the appropriate level, uh, that they have the appropriate number of spell points. Uh, and if you don't, you get some, you know, flavor text. Uh, and then if you do, you can start getting into actual spells. So here's the full list of spells. We're just gonna go with this one because it's easy to understand. So uh, we use the, the game handler to check that the location has the player in it. So this is identifying this player by name. Uh, and if we get one, now we get that user's profile, uh, see if the user is protected with this particular protection. Uh, and then if they are, nothing happens, but everyone gets these messages. So here again, we have that one, you know, that, that zero, one, two uh, message structure here where the, the actor gets the zero, the target gets the one, and the bystanders get the two. So in this particular case, it's like you try to cast the spell, but nothing happens. Uh, the one that the target sees is like someone casts a spell on you, but nothing happened. And then uh, the, the O2 message here is everyone else in the room sees the caster cast a spell at the target, but nothing happened. So if they're not protected, now we go down here, check their inventory, uh, and uh, we identify the stolen item, and then uh, put a message together saying like you you vaporized their diamond or whatever, and then it figures out who needs to get what messages. Uh, you can see they're all the same sort of uh, printf here. So you know here it's uh, the actor, and then the thing that you're affecting and then the name of the target, and then the thing again, and then uh, the actor's name again. Oh, this doesn't vaporize it, this grabs it. So that's what it is. If you, it's, It'll say something like, Jack uh, cast a spell against Mary, and Mary's diamond now appears in Jack's hand. So that's uh, how it builds out all of these messages. It knows uh, what other players are there and sends them the appropriate message, and then, uh, you know, gives the uh, the item to uh, to the player now after it's removed it from the uh, the player that had it before. So there's a whole bunch of these. Some of them do damage. Some of them have different uh, uh, you know different effects. There's healing and again item stealing and looking at what players have memorized and whatever. So uh, cast here is uh, is pretty meaty. All right, now, how do we integrate with Slack? Uh, we have the Slack incoming module, and it accepts messages from Slack for all kinds of things, uh, messaging, uh, slash commands, Slack events, you know, all, all the different ways that uh, the users can interact with Slack. Uh, it will uh, it'll handle that and throw up events for you to listen to. Uh, and, uh, and and get these interactions going. I have this posted for an alpha release. It's at uh, the Slack incoming uh, uh, project on Drupal.org. So you can play with this and, uh, and experiment with it. Uh, 
you know, I don't know that it's ready for a production app. I'm not using it for anything production right now. I really only wrote it to do this. Uh, so I'm not super vigilant about maintaining it, but if people start using it, I will be. Uh, so anyway, that's where you can get it. Uh, we have a custom authentication provider here. We want to make sure that some villain isn't sending random messages to, uh, to your app pretending to be Slack. Uh, so Slack's authentication scheme, their API documentation, they specify a signing secret that's defined for the app. Uh, and then we have an authentication provider that, uh, that goes through the rigmarole of, of, uh, of testing that signing secret. Uh, and since it's an actual authentication provider, you can now, you know, it's got a, a service and you can just declare this Slack incoming signing secret true, put that on any route that you define. And now all of the routes get uh, validated for, uh, you know, valid Slack traffic. So anytime you're creating a, a, an endpoint for a slash command, for instance, you just pop this right on your route definition and it'll take care of all the validation for you. If we go over how Slack works, uh, you know how, how how the interaction happens uh, when a user sends the bot a message. Now uh, Slack responds to that event and then pushes that event metadata to the URL uh, specified in your event setup. Uh, again, I'll get to all of the uh, the Slack commands shortly. Um, I know we're running out of time. Like I said, this is a pretty dense presentation. Um, so uh, we authenticate, and then the controller decodes that message packet, fires off the Slack event, and then whatever listeners uh, are going to listen to it, listen to it, and they do their thing. And then it, uh, as soon as it can, it returns that 200 response. Uh, Slack expects that, uh, that response within three seconds. If it doesn't get a 200 within three seconds, it'll start resending messages, sometimes a bunch of times. Uh, there's a tiny CC link, Frank, uh, all the way up at the top of the uh, the chat that has uh, the link to the uh, repository with the code in it that also has a link to the talk at another camp, which has all the slides on it. Uh, I realized I didn't actually have the slide file in the repo, although I should add it. Uh, Slash commands work kind of the same way, except like I said before, uh, the uh, interacting with a slash command is sort of the user's uh, authorizing Slack in order to, uh, yes, thank you, uh, in order to uh, interact with the user. Uh, so we have custom endpoints defined there. They're, they're just routes with controller methods. Uh, now to set up a Slack workspace, this is real easy. You just go to slack.com uh, slash create. Put in your email there, you know, validate who you are. You just do some description and it collects some data about you. Uh, and then you click launch workspace. Your workspace is created. And now you can go to api.slack.com and create the actual app. So again, the, it, it'll, it'll kind of walk you through this. I'm going to skip through this a little bit. Uh, and now in order to set up the, uh, the app, you know, don't worry about these keys and whatever. You know, there's nothing here to worry about hacking. Uh, I've already torn down the, uh, the the application that we used to screenshot these, and I'm going to be tearing down the application that I'm demoing on right now. So there's no worry about key security or anything like that. Uh, these were these will all be expired in 15 minutes. Uh, so what we care about here is this signing secret, uh, and we have. Uh, a, a configuration form so we can go to uh, config web services slack incoming put in our signing secret putting in our uh, our oauth token and that excuse me if there's any uh, requirement to change the slack api url we can but uh, i don't see a reason why you would need to do that uh, now you go into the slack app and enable events and here's where you put in the endpoint for that slack action endpoint this is where it does the url validation uh, as soon as you type in the, your URL here, it'll uh, it'll verify it. We have the event that handles that, so you just give it Slack slash action endpoint, uh, and then you tell it what events you want to subscribe to. Again, our game here only cares about the app home opened, which is the home tab, uh, and message.im, uh, which is how the uh, the the bot uh, uh, fires up uh, events when it gets messages. We save that 
And now we have two slash commands. We have slash games and slash join game with a game ID on it. Uh, join is reserved. You can't, uh, you can't do that. Uh, so we have games, and that is what lists out the games available uh, on our app. And then join game actually joins you into a current game, sets your current game up uh, as Kairadia and lets you interact with it. So uh, here again, these are just kind of regular routes. Uh, we have a controller for each one of them. Uh, we have the Slack incoming signing secret on each one of them. Uh, and then when you're setting them up, you just go and you create a new command, type in what it's supposed to be, have the endpoint. Uh, you can give it a description and usage hints. Uh, we have, again, two of them. We have games and join game. Uh, so the usage hint, you know, it'll, it'll pop up like this slash join game. And then it, uh, you know, it gives you some text hints there. Uh, now we go back to the app homepage. Uh, make sure your bot is shown online. Uh, and then you go to OAuth and permissions uh, and scroll down and add in scopes. Uh, make sure that you do chat colon write if you want it to uh, send your users messages. Uh, every time I'm doing a Slack app and it's not sending back messages, I, I think 100% of the time it has been because I have either forgotten to select the chat write scope or I've clicked a different one by mistake. Uh, so uh, make sure that when, you're, uh, when you want an app that's gonna send messages back, make sure you have this scope in here. So make sure you have your OAuth bot key first, uh, and if that's correct, then make sure you have this scope on here, and then you should be able to interact with, uh, with Slack both ways. Uh, so then uh, you go and you get your, your, bot, uh, your, your OAuth token, and you put it in that same uh, Slack incoming um, config screen that, uh, that I showed before. And now once that's all done, you get to click the big green install app button, it validates the permissions that you're going to give it. You allow it, and then bam, there it is. Now you get to see it in your uh, recent apps, and uh, and then stuff will start working. So, for instance, if uh, here here we have a new user, I can list out slash games. It says we have the following games: Kyrandia. Ah. Uh, there we go. Yeah, uh, like I said, with the NGROC and the video share and whatever, and now early evening uh, streaming traffic to contend with, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, we're timing out here. I'll, I'll just uh, enter the actual commands here. Okay, so now we join the game uh, on the major BBS. It pages all of this, you know, press return to continue. Uh, so for Slack, we're not doing that. We're just dumping this all out. But uh, now we just joined the game here. And now uh, we can see that it's multiplayer and we have uh, you know users interacting with each other here. So here, if I go north, then it'll tell me that I left. Now, if this player follows, now it'll uh, say that uh, that they came in. All right, so uh, testing, kernel tests could have done all this, uh, but most of what I was testing was actually validating the actual game behavior. Uh, so I did it all with Behat. So, uh, you know, we've had a whole bunch of talks and buffs and sessions and stuff about what to use Behat for. Apparently the... Uh, you know, the original creator of Behat is kind of, you know, throwing his hands up in the air in awe of all the things that uh, B hackers like me have put together for this. Uh, so I'm effectively kernel testing the, uh, you know, the the whole game module with Behat and not going through the UI at all. Uh, but you know, I needed to test uh, the interactions and get all the messages back and the terms had to exist and whatever. So. Uh, you know, it, it, it was just so time consuming to mock all of the things that every, uh, you know, every command needed uh, that it was easier just to write out a couple of custom steps and uh, and test them all that way. Uh, so everything we used here is uh, is on GitHub, the original Galacticom source code. I don't know that I actually have permission to it, but it's 30 plus years old. 
So I think I do. Uh, if a CND letter comes, I will absolutely take it all down. Uh, but Slack incoming is on Drupal.org. Word grammar is on Drupal.org. The MUD module is not, uh, you know, again, I don't know that this is prime time or even in an alpha release, but you can get it from the repo, uh, which has a link to my old MidCamp page for this talk, which has the slides on it. Um, I know that we are over time, but I have time to take questions if, uh, if anybody has them. Uh, if you wouldn't mind reposting them, because I was switching back and forth so often and I couldn't always see the chat. So uh, post them up again uh, so that I can see what they are. I'm happy to take the time to answer your questions. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this was totally a labor of love. I don't even know how many hours I have in this now, uh, but uh, Oh, yeah. Um, I th Let's see. Here it is. A queue worker that resets itself every eight seconds. Yeah, that could that could work. Um, uh, you know, that might be that even even that might be you know, expensive to uh, to put in. It would have to you know, it would have to know how to manage itself. Uh, but I guess the uh, the cron job to do the res you know, the daily respawn could kick it off, and then as the uh, the queue worker uh, fires, it would then you know re queue itself. That 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 could happen. All right. Oh, we have uh, people who want to come in. Let's see. OK, I think I just uh, added everyone. Could you take the back end and run a custom JS front end? Uh, sure you could. Uh, the, uh, the way I have it is the, uh, um, the actual MUD event listeners and, uh, and plugins are more or less separated from the, like they're, they're, they're you know, separate from the Slack ones. You, you, you could use whatever you wanted to call up the MUD commands and plugins and uh, uh, put up responses and whatever you want. I just happen to have them all wired up through that Slack incoming event listener. But yeah, if you want, like I, I, I started a, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you could you could totally replace it with JSON API. Yeah. Okay. The question: What is the difference between the Slack incoming module and the Slack module? Um, I don't want to badmouth anyone's work or anything like that. You know, a lot of work went into the Slack module, but it didn't do any of the things that I needed it to do with any ease. Uh, I wanted a nice, easy way of interacting with messages coming from Slack, and I wanted a just as easy API hook or you know, service uh, in order to post things back to Slack. The Slack module didn't give me any of that. Uh, I had a really uh, a really hard time using it. I did start out uh, using that one to begin with and found that it simply did not do what I wanted it to do. So Slack incoming is actually a lot more powerful than, uh, than Slack. Uh, and it lets you interact with any of the Slack events that, uh, you know, that you want. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time, especially, uh, especially the last slot of the con. I, uh, I appreciate you sticking around and uh, watching what I put together.